that uh, Bar Shop faculty hires, both in 2016, you were what, August, Andrew? Yes. Uh, uh, Andrew Pickering hired up, started here in August. Uh, Carl Rodriguez started in November, I think. So we're going to hear an update on their programs, on what their labs have been doing over the last several months, um, and I think hopefully getting a, an idea of where they want to go in the near future. Uh, I guess you're going first, right, Andrew? I, I am indeed. Oh, oh, I see. So, I, I got, I got you. That works. Okay, I, I would like to start by thanking the organizers, Dr. Adam Salman and Dr. Yuki Aquino, for providing me the opportunity to present some of my work in this forum. As many of you are aware, and as Dr. Salman uh, just introduced, uh, my lab started here at UTESCA about six months ago. In planning this presentation, I decided instead of presenting some of my postdoctoral work, which many in this room have already heard, that it might be more interesting to present some of the work or one of the projects that my group started here in UTESCA in the last uh, six months. The caveat to this is that this work is less complete than I would normally like for a presentation of this type, and some of the conclusions are not as solid as we would normally like. Uh, I would also like to emphasize at the start of this talk, this talk involves uh, neurodegeneration and cognitive function. I am not a neurobiologist. We were not planning this project to go down a neurobiology route. As a product, there may be some things I say that are highly apocryphal, and if you're a neurobiologist in the room, do feel free to tell me. With age, there is a progressive decline in proteasomal activity. This decline has been widely reported by a large number of groups in a range of model systems and in a variety of different tissues. A decline in proteasomal activity with age has been reported Oh, no, that was bad. There's the laser. Um, in the brain, in the heart, in the liver, in skeletal muscle, in the retina and lens of the eye, in the spinal cord, in the lymphocytes, and in the epidermis. The story is not quite this simple, and before I go too much further into this story, I wanted to take a back step and uh, talk a little bit about different forms of proteasome. There are two major forms of proteasome in animals. There is the 20S proteasome, which is composed of 14 subunits uh, comprising four heptameric rings. There is also the 26S proteasome, which possesses the 20S proteasomal core, but also has a 19S regulator at the top and or the bottom of the complex. Both of these proteasomes have the same proteolytic activities. Uh, this is because the proteolytic enzymes are all present in the 20S core. They each have trypsin-like activity, chymotrypsin-like activity, and peptidoglutamyl hydrolyzing-like activity. The difference in these two forms of proteasome is the sort of proteins they degrade. Here, the 26S proteasome selectively degrades polyubiquitinated proteins, here, polybicrotinated proteins will selectively bind to the 19S regulatory cap where they are unfolded and fed into the core to be degraded. In contrast, the 20S proteasome lacks uh, a 19S regulatory cap, so it cannot selectively bind polybicrotinated proteins. Instead, it appears to selectively degrade oxidized or misfolded proteins. There is some thinking in the literature that hydrophobic residues uh, on the external surface of misfolded or oxidized proteins will selectively bind to the alpha ring where they are unfolded and fed into the core. The two forms of proteasome are also quite different in size. This is very important for reasons that shall become apparent later. The 20S proteasome is about 800 kilodaltons in size, while the 26S proteasome is 2.8 megadaltons in size. This means that we can separate the different forms of proteasome by molecular weight. Again, this will become relevant in a minute. The reason why I wanted to talk about different forms of proteasome 
is that the two different forms respond very differently um, over the course of aging. A number of groups have reported an age-associated decline in 26S proteasomal activity, while 20S proteasomal activity appears either to decline very slightly, to remain about the same, or in some studies even to increase, depending on which tissue you look at, which organism you look at, and which investigator did the study. This, uh, I, I've included here an example um, study from one group about 10 years ago where they looked at uh, tissue from old and young fruit flies. Uh, here they ran a native page gel to look at proteasomal activity, separating the different forms of proteasome by molecular weight. They then incubated the gel with a proteolytic substrate which fluoresces when it is degraded. So measuring proteolytic activity of the different forms of proteasome. Here they saw with age that there was a loss of 26S proteasomal activity, while if you can make it out, which you really can't, um, 20S proteasomal activity remained about the same. When they ran immunoblots to try to work out what was causing this decline, they saw an age-associated decline in 26S proteasomal assembly, while 20S proteasomal assembly actually appeared to increase. This is something that has been reported by a number of groups. We see the same effect here, where they used a different measure and instead fractionated the samples based on molecular weight. We see in young individuals, most of the existing proteasome is present in higher molecular weight fractions, while in older individuals, most of the proteasome is present in lower molecular weight fractions. There is about the same... Oh, hello. Um, uh, I was curious about what, what tissue we're looking at here. And this is uh, looking at whole fruit flies. Oh, this is fruit this, this is fruit flies. Oh. There, there are studies in um, different tissues from mice, but in this particular study, it's looking at, at, a, whole, at a whole fruit fly. Um, in mice, it, it replicates to the same sort of extent. Um, it certainly replicates to the extent of the, the changes in activities. Um, I'm not sure whether they see an increase in 20S proteasomal levels as they do in the flies. But to my knowledge, it it's mostly replicates in mice. I would assume it also replicates in rats, but I, I do not know. There are a number of uh, explanations uh, for why we see this age-associated decline in 26S proteasomal assembly. Um, the ATP is required for 26S proteasomal assembly, and there's an argument that an age-associated decline in ATP levels might reduce 26S proteasomal assembly. Another theory is that age-associated misregulation of the chaperones involved in assembling the 26S proteasomal complex might be driving this disassembly of 26S proteasome. Another theory I wanted to uh, bring up was one which uh, my group and another group uh, during my PhD work suggested. Uh, here we were looking at cells exposed to oxidative stress. We found that when cells are exposed to an oxidant, that there was a programmed disassembly of 26S proteasome into 320S proteasome, and that this represented a deliberate response uh, to uh, transiently increase the ability of the cell to degrade oxidized proteins. This response existed for one to three hours after which the 26S proteasome was reassembled. It is possible that higher oxidative damage in older individuals or lower functionality of existing 20S proteasome in older individuals might be driving a deliberate disassembly of existing 26S proteasome to maintain or improve 20S proteasomal function. The study I wanted to present today focuses specifically on the brain. As with um, other tissues, there is an age-associated decline in 20S proteasomal function. 
this has been reported um, in whole brains from gerbils that they see a decline in 26 S proteasomal function and about the unchanging levels of 20 S proteasomal activity. Uh, it has also been reported in mice in multiple parts of the brain. There's been reports of an age-associated decline in proteasomal function in the cortex, in the hippocampus, in the cerebellum, and in the brainstem. This decline in proteasomal function has been suggested by some authors to have a role in age-associated neurodegeneration. There are reports, for instance, that inhibition of neuroblasts in cell culture cause uh, neuronal cell death. There are also reports in rats which are deficient for neuronal proteasome expression that these rats experienced increased cell death um, in their nervous system and also the occurrence of Louis, uh, of, uh, Louis body-like formation or Louis-like body formation. Hello. Do you know if polydeclination uh, If you give me two slides, I will answer that. <laughs> Hello. Uh, when you see these age-related changes, mm -hmm. There, is, uh, there are some reports uh, of identifiable apoptosis. I'm not aware of cellular senescence. There could well be, but I'm, I'm not personally aware of reports. Okay. Um, the, this study I will be presenting is mostly in fruit flies as our model organism of choice. My group uh, confirmed that we see the same declines in proteasomal activity in the head of the flies which we use as an approximation for the brain, as the brain is very small and difficult to run a lot of molecular biology on. We see that in heads from old flies, uh, there is reduced 26S proteasomal activity, while 20S proteasomal activity, there's maybe a slight decline, though the decline does not reach statistical significance. Randy. We... Uh, we do it uh, um, in vitro. We, we take the head, we, we grind it up, we uh, create a lysate, we incubate the lysate with a proteolytic substrate which fluoresces when it is degraded. So we are simply looking for an increase in fluorescence. Hello, Miranda. What age are the young flies? The young flies are 10 days old uh, or 10 days post occlusion, which is. We, we regard all development to have occurred at that point, and the old flies are 70 days old. I like to take a view that uh, you can roughly translate fly a, a human age into fly age by converting years to days. Um, flies, w very few flies will live past 100 days, which about fits with 100 years for humans. So a 70-day-old fly is a good approximation for a 70-year-old human. As Bess asked, um, we were interested in whether this age-associated decline in proteasomal activity might uh, uh, coincide with increases in polyubiquitination. Other groups have previously reported an age-associated increase in polyubiquitin aggregates in the, mus in the flight muscles of flies with age and I believe there are a number of reports of age-associated increases in polyubiquitination in tissue from mice. We found in brains that we had isolated that we likewise saw an increase in polyubiquitin aggregates accumulating in the brains of older flies. And, hello. Before you go on, mm -hmm. I think, um, at least when you submit this, uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I've not yet. I plan to. Um, so this data, which I'm actually presenting, is 
quite old data that my group generated, I think something, something like 2012, which we never published for another story that never got used. We're, we're planning to replicate these experiments actually in the next few weeks, and I think at the same time it would be very interesting to look at in jail differences. But yes, I fully agree. My group was interested in whether this age-associated decline in proteosomal function might, have, might play a contributing role to age-associated neurodegeneration, at least in the fly, and whether augmentation of the proteosomal system in older flies might be able to delay such neurodegeneration. The challenge that we had with this system is that, as I described earlier, the proteasome is quite a large, complex uh, um, protein. It comprises 14 to 28 subunits, and there is a complex process of assembling the different subunits to form the complex. So it's, it's not as straightforward as you might think to just overexpress it. To manage to overexpress the uh, proteasome, we made use of a genetic trick developed by Staphos Gonis' lab about 10 years ago. Here in mammalian cell culture, he reported that when you overexpress the beta-5 subunit, which is present in the 20S core, that you not only increase whole proteasome assembly, but you by a mechanism that we still really do not understand, somehow augment expression of a large number of other proteasomal subunits at the same time. Here his group reported that when they overexpressed the beta-5 subunit, that they also saw increases in the beta-1 subunit, the beta-2 subunit, the alpha-6 subunit, the alpha-7 subunit. His group uh, went on to report that this increased uh, proteasomal activity. They subsequently recapitulated this finding in nematode worms, uh, I think, last year. My group was interested in whether we could replicate this in the flies and whether neuronal-specific overexpression of this subunit could delay um, neurodegeneration. To do this, we created a transgenic fly where we inserted a copy of PROS beta-5, which is the fly orthologue of the beta-5 subunit. We fused this insert with an inducible UAS promoter. We then crossed the line with a strong um, constitutive driver, and we found, uh, sorry, a strong ubiquitous driver. And we found that indeed the line was functional, that uh, we were able to use this line to increase expression, mRNA expression of the PROS beta 5 subunit. Interestingly, we also saw an increase in a number of other proteasomal subunits. We saw a significant increase in the alpha-1 subunit, the beta-1 subunit, the alpha-2 subunit, the beta-4 subunit, and the beta-6 subunit. We saw an increase in proteasomal activity. Here we saw an increase both in 20S and 26S proteasomal activity with overexpression of the PROS beta-5 subunit. As a secondary measure of proteasomal activity and as a measure of whole proteasome assembly, we ran a native page in gel overlay where we ran samples out on a native page gel to separate the different forms of proteasome by molecular weight and incubated the gel with a proteolytic substrate which will fluoresce when it is degraded. Here we again saw an increase both in activity at the 20S band and the 26S band implying an increase in whole proteasome assembly in our transgenic line. As a functional measure, we uh, evaluated stress resistance in these flies by putting the flies on food which contained a toxic dose of hydrogen peroxide and seeing how long the flies lived. We found that our transgenic flies were significantly more stress resistant and survived significantly longer than the their control litimates uh, under the hydrogen peroxide challenge. Can you check the other subunit that's only beta 5 or something very special about it to regulate the other that, that, That's an interesting question. I'm not aware of uh, other groups reporting that overexpression of other subunits have uh, 
can produce a similar effect, whether that means they tried it and they didn't, it didn't work, or nobody tried it because they got the Beta 5 system to work, I'm not entirely clear. The Beta 1, Beta 2, and Beta 5 subunits uh, are the subunits, are the enzymatically active subunits, uh, and there is, there is reason to think those will be the three most indispensable subunits. Uh, but it, it's entirely possible that, that regulation of one of those, other, of either of those other two subunits might induce whole proteasome assembly. We, we honestly haven't tried it. Uh, hello, Miranda. It, when we ubiquitously overexpress it, there is not. Um, my group um, drove uh, overexpression of this system in various tissues. Uh, when we express it throughout the body, we so see no lifespan effect. Uh, when we expressed it in the gut, we saw no lifespan improvement either. When we overexpressed it in the brain, I will tell you about it on the next slide. Uh, so my group, uh, um, well, I, I, I kind of spoiled that. But, um, my, my group was interested in whether we, when we overexpress the system in the nervous system, we might see any improvements either to survival or um, neurodegeneration or other effects. The first thing we looked at was lifespan. To evaluate this, we cross the flies to a neuronal specific driver called LV gene switch GAL4, which expresses limits overexpression specifically to the brain in the flies. Doing this, we saw a modest and reasonably robust lifespan extension. We saw about a 10% extension in median lifespan and about a 10% extension in maximal lifespan. We have repeated this assay twice, and we see about the same effect at both times. We are currently running a third repeat of this experiment. Having seen that this seems to make flies live longer when we neuronally overexpress uh, the uh, frost beta 5 subunit, we were interested in whether this had any health span implications. To evaluate this, we um, made use of a fruit fly T maze system. Here, flies are put in a chamber with electrical plating along the sides of the chamber. The flies are then exposed to a mild electrical shock. The shock is designed to cause discomfort without actually causing any damage. As the flies are exposed to this shock, we simultaneously expose them to an odor, which for the purposes of this talk, we will term the negative odor. We expose the flies to this negative odor and an electrical shock for a period of two minutes. We then stop the electrical shock and expose the flies to a different odor, which in this talk we will refer to as the positive odor. We repeat this experiment five times, shocking the flies while exposing them to the negative odor and not shocking the flies while we expose them to the positive odor. The goal of this is to train the flies to associate uh, the negative odor with a negative experience and the positive odor to no negative experience. Having done this, we move the flies into another chamber where they are exposed to both odors. They are exposed to the negative odor from one side of the chamber and the positive odor from the other side of the chamber. The flies are then allowed to choose which uh, chamber they wish to move into. Naive flies, which have not been exposed to any training, roughly choose either odor with equal likelihood. There is a slight, maybe 10% preference for one of the odors over the other odor, but for the most part we can assume that there is no preference without training. In contrast, when flies are trained to associate uh, one of the odors with a negative sensation, they will strongly select, they will show a strong selection for going into the chamber with the positive odor. When we did this experimentally, we saw exactly what I showed diagrammatically. We saw that with training, there was enhanced selection for the positive odor 
over the negative odor. In contrast, when we did the same experiment in older flies, we saw little to no improvement in selection for the positive odor following training. The trained flies appeared to select odors with about the same preference as naive flies. When we ran the same experiment in flies which overexpressed the, in older flies which overexpressed the pros beta 5 subunit, we continued to see some degree of selection for the positive odor over the negative odor in trained flies. This suggests that uh, overexpression of the beta 5 subunit is improving the fly's ability to learn to associate, uh, is improving the ability of older flies to either learn to associate the negative sensation with the negative odor or an improved ability to remember that association. Hello? Mm -hmm. We, um, we haven't yet. We, we certainly plan to um, in the cohort which we are just setting up. I, I think it's, it's unlikely that we'll see a select, an improved selection in those animals, but no, that, that was a point that we, this has been raised by other individuals, and I agree it's an important test to run, and we plan to run it. I think there was another question. What are the of uh, What are Oh, um, 200 flies per sample. We, um, each, of these, uh, graph, each of these charts represent four assays comprising 50 flies per assay. The statistics are based on the averages amongst those four replicates of 50 flies. So, Miranda. That, that, that is an excellent point, uh, and uh, it, would be, it would be difficult to determine that. But, um, we, we have not determined whether that is the case, but yes, that is absolutely a confounding issue. So I think there was a question from Brian. Well, I have a, a simple version of, of that question. Mm -hmm. Can you try to, 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 to test uh, negative and no no? No. Um, we've uh, flipped the um, odors uh, that, uh, so the, the experiments uh, I'm showing, we did half of the experiments uh, where the, the two odors, one is free octanol and the other is uh, methyl cyclohexanol. And two of the experiments, octanol was the negative odor, methyl cyclohexanol was the positive. The other two experiments, it was flipped. Uh, um, no, we have not done an experiment of uh, just of one odor versus no odor. The flies do show a, if the flies are exposed to one odor on one side but no odor on the other side, they will almost always all go to the side where there is an odor, that they, there is a selection. They are attracted to the presence of an odor. Uh, was there another question? Or? Yes. It, it's, it's entirely possible that the presence of multiple flies could. Uh, um, it, it is relatively experimentally difficult to test this in individual flies. Uh, each run of the assay takes half an hour to an hour um, for number. The numbers that we use of about 200 flies per condition represents about the power that is necessary for this assay. Um, it would be very time consuming to individually do flies, but um, I, in short, I don't have an answer for you. Hello. We, we, we are using a driver which is uh, limiting overexpression to the brain okay. so that uh, in the rest of the body we are assuming uh, that 
expressions should be unchanged. Okay, Tom. He's trying to suggest that like, you know, in, other, in other systems there's like a you know, uh, climate proteasome, there's immune proteasome. Okay. Or part of the system, maybe there's a different type of neuronal proteasome that's not able to find this different. The other seven is different. I see. Um, there is no immunoproteasome in fruit flies. Immunoproteasome is limited specifically to the vertebrates. Uh, there is a regulatory cap, um, it's a PA28 gamma, I think, um, which does exist in fruit flies. Uh, um, it is entirely possible that it may be differently abundant in the nervous system in contrast to the rest of the tissue. Um, we, we don't have any data on this. No. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh. So the, the beta-5 subunit has chymotrypsin-like activity. I, I mentioned at the start of my talk that there are three different proteolytic activities that the proteasome has uh, made up of three of the subunits, the beta-1, the beta-2, and the beta-5 subunit, of which the chymotrypsin-like activity is uh, uh, accomplished by the beta-5 subunit. Okay. Uh, in ongoing research, my group is, is this polite? Yes. Uh, in ongoing research, my group is interested in answering, in asking a number of questions. The overexpression line that we have been using increases both 20S and 26S proteasomal function. And my group was interested in trying to work out whether the, the beneficial effects we are seeing is a product of improved 20S proteasomal function or improved 26S proteasomal function. To start to answer this, we are in the process of making use of another transgenic line, which overexpresses the gene RPN11. RPN11 is a subunit of the 19S regulatory cap, which is specific to the 26S proteasome. It has been reported by other groups that overexpression of this subunit can increase 26S proteasomal assembly and activity while not changing 20S proteasomal function. My group received the kind donation of a transgenic line for overexpression of RPN11, and we are in the process of establishing whether overexpression of RPN11 can recapitulate the findings from overexpression of uh, uh, PROS beta 5. Another direction my group is pursuing is evaluating translatability of these effects into mammals. We are generating two transgenic lines. Uh, in mice, the first contains an additional copy of PSMB5, which is the mouse ortholog of PROS beta 5, fused to a neuronal specific NSE promoter. The second line we are generating contains a premature stop site flanked by two LOXP sequences downstream of the NSP, NSE promoter and upstream of the PSMB5 cDNA. This enables us to, with the use of a Cree line, limit overexpression either to particular parts of the brain or perhaps using a tamoxifen system to induce overexpression merely after development or at other life stages. A third direction my lab is pursuing with this project is to establish whether this uh, intervention might uh, have positive uh, effects on Alzheimer's disease. The reason for our interest in this uh, um, there have been a number of studies that proteasomal activity declines in Alzheimer's disease. These, uh, 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 this has been reported in in vitro experiments where beta amyloid has been incubated with uh, uh, purified proteasome, where proteasomal activity has been shown to decline with increasing levels of beta amyloid. It has been shown in cell culture, in cells transfected to overexpress amyloid beta, they saw uh, sharp decreases in, uh, oh sorry, uh, it was this one. They saw sharp decreases in proteasomal activity in cells which overexpress beta amyloid. It has also been shown in mice with the 
APP uh, Swedish uh, mutant, which is a model for familial Alzheimer's disease, uh, where, again, they saw in neuronal cells a decline in proteasomal activity. The mechanism by which this uh, um, reduced decline in proteasomal activity occurs is not entirely clear. I've been led to understand the working hypothesis is that external beta amyloid, some external beta amyloid may be internalized through membrane trafficking, which may interact with proteasome within the cell. Though in discussing this with other people who are a lot more knowledgeable of this field than I, I've been led to understand that this uh, idea is somewhat controversial. Regardless, there is a decent body of literature that by some mechanism, proteasomal activity declines uh, in Alzheimer's disease. And as I mentioned earlier on in this talk, there is some suggestion that declines in proteasomal function may contribute to neurodegeneration. As a consequence, my group was interested in whether augmentation of the proteasomal system might be able to alleviate some of the pathology related to Alzheimer's disease. To evaluate this, we made use of a amyloid beta overexpressing fly model. This fly contained a copy of the amyloid beta uh, precursor protein, BAC1, and the amyloid beta um, cleavage protein, uh, APP. Both of these proteins were driven um, to be overexpressed specifically in the brain through an L Aviv driver. We found that with overexpression of these uh, amyloid beta proteins, that uh, flies were substantially shorter lived uh, than wild type flies, which did not overexpress these proteins. I want to emphasize this lifespan is still ongoing. Uh, all of the conclusions I say may well change by the time the lifespan finishes. In contrast, when we jointly overexpressed PROS beta 5 in these uh, Alzheimer's flies, we saw a, reduced, uh, a reduction in early mortality in this fly model. If this trend continues as the lifespan progresses, this would suggest that uh, overexpression of PROS beta 5 appears to be delaying some of the pathology relating to beta amyloid overexpression in these flies. My group is now interested in establishing reproducibility of this, evaluating whether we see any improvements in cognitive function in these flies as a health span measure, as we did with uh, um, the cognitive aging measures shown earlier. Andrew? Hello. This is human APP? Um, this, this, is is hum -like, right? this is human APP, yes. This is human APP and human BACE1, both of which are being overexpressed in the fly. Yes. Um, in summary, my group found that uh, aging is associated with a decline in proteasomal function uh, in the nervous system. We found that when we restored neuronal proteasomal function, that we uh, increased lifespan in these flies, and we delayed uh, at least one measure of cognitive uh, learning and memory. We showed that uh, Alzheimer's disease results in, a, in diminished proteasomal function, and we reported that elevated proteasome levels appears to delay some of the pathology related to Alzheimer's disease. My group is now interested in trying to develop a mechanistic understanding of what is going on, as well as trying to establish if these effects are translatable into mammals. That forms the end of my talk, and I will now happily take any questions, comments, or issues. Thank you. All right. Uh, most of you know me. I've been here a while. So it's great to see uh, my graduate student mentor, uh, Maria Gazinska, in the audience. So, all right. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, uh, kind of the direction of the project that sort of started with uh, my, my first postdoc uh, in, with Rochelle Buffenstein and sort of has extended to look at uh, this particular small heat shock chaperone and what it does and how it extends lifespan 
and to kind of look at the transcription, possible transcriptional control and pathways um, involved with HSP25 overexpression. So, all right, so along with a lot of other types of pathways, such as stem cell exhaustion, cellular senescence, the loss of protein homeostasis is one of the hallmarks of aging, such as that as you age, you lose this uh, ability to misfold and handle proteins. They can become deleterious. A lot of information, um, uh, a lot of literature suggests that the accumulation of these can uh, cause uh, oligotoxic, uh, sorry, toxic oligomers and aggregates that might cause neurodegeneration. So when I was in uh, Dr. Buffenstein's lab, we wanted to see if uh, protein homeostasis correlated with maximum lifespan in rodents. So we looked at uh, several different species that ranged in mass from um, 21 grams to 600 grams, and in age from uh, four years old, the laboratory mouse, to the 31, 32-year-old um, naked mole rat. So what we found was that um, we looked at, we looked actually, so I guess I can st take a step back. So originally when I was in Dr. Buffenstein's lab, I looked at uh, proteasome expression, ironically, and we saw high levels. So we kind of did a study on a different on both a proteasome activity, uh, proteasome subunits, and chaperones that the literature had suggested were associated with proteasome control. So when we looked at these, we looked at protein expression uh, using Western blots. We saw that uh, HSP25 and HSF1 correlated with maximum lifespan potential in muscle and in liver. So we, look, we looked at uh, these tissues from a number of these animals, like I said, and then uh, we performed uh, both a residual mass and phylogenetic independent contrast analysis, that kind of tool, tools that you use in comparative biology. Um, basically, most things that correlate with lifespan also correlate with mass, so we want to uh, take that out of the equation. And then phylogeny shows a lot of similar traits so when you look at phylogeny, so for example, um, in this case, mice and rats are very similar in phylogeny, and uh, naked mole rats and Damarland mole rats are also similar. So those are kind of pared down to one point, and you repeat the analysis. And what we found is that uh, HSP25 and its putative transcriptional factor, HSF1, were still uh, significant and correlated with maximum lifespan potential in both muscle and liver. Um, and interestingly, we also saw that uh, proteasome activity uh, correlated with maximum lifespan, so chymotrypsin-like and PGPH activity, but only in muscle, not in liver. And we saw a couple of autophagy markers, a marker of liposome, uh, autophagosome formation and auto, uh, autophagy initiation also corresponded with maximum lifespan potential. So, uh, kind of, so a lot of work has been done on HSF1, but it's very interesting that we, we kind of really don't know um, what the client proteins are necessarily throughout the lifetime of an animal with these uh, downstream, mo uh, downstream molecules of these transcription factors. So I think looking at downstream effector molecules can really help us to look at more specific molecular targets uh, in aging and disease. So I turn to the uh, C. elegans worm as a model organism. Um, these are the reasons for using C. elegans. Uh, you can uh, it's, uh, you can look at, you can take these correlative relationships and find causal relationships from these sort of correlative studies. So you go from phenomenology to mechanism. You look at, you can, uh, look, they're small, they're transparent, so you can use uh, fluorescent markers. There's a lot of powerful genetics that you can use and a rich heritage of established mutants and transgenes. They have a short developmental time, so you can get to the mechanism uh, very, relatively quickly. And biochemical pathways such as HSF1 pathway, the NRF2 skin1 pathway, the FOXO DAF16 insulin signaling DAF2 pathway are very highly conserved in worms compared to vertebrates. So here's what we did. Uh, we used a ubiquitous promoter, um, and we, we actually uh, took the cDNA from the naked mole at HSP25, attached a GFP tag, and it's a, unc uh, it's a cassette to rescue the worms that we use a bombardment technique established uh, or not a, well, this is from a, one of Al's papers in JOVE, but basically this is a technique that was established, is established in his lab. So we do a kind of a double screen. We screen for the rescue of the unk mutation. So these worms are uncoordinated, they don't move. And then we look for GFP uh, expression and we find these uh, naked mole worms. 
is with the help of Maruf and, and Al. Um, so then we, the first thing we looked at was to look at heat shock. So heat shock is a very strong technique to look at survival and the effect of these chaperone proteins. So we looked at it. There are numerous different lines that are uh, generated from this bombardment technique. So we looked at these various lines. Um, black here is the control. And uh, for example, this green one here showed the best effect with heat shock survival at 35 degrees. It lives a lot longer than the control. And then uh, when we looked at the western blot of this, you see this had the highest level of HSP25 uh, GFP expression. So it kind of correlated. Uh, so the heat survival correlated with protein expression. So we took this animal, uh, this animal line and back crossed it several times and repeated the heat resistance. And we still saw it after several back crosses. You see that the, uh, control, the uh, HSP25 overexpression has a higher survival than that of the control. And then we took the next step, which is look at lifespan survival. And here, this is at 25 degree lifespan survival. And you see that the animal, the HSP25 overexpressing animal, has a 24% increase in median lifespan, uh, about that, a 25% increase in mean lifespan, and it lives longer as well. And this is a highly repeatable. Um, uh, so when we looked at the, what these animals looked like, so uh, this is a control worm, so it's a vector control. It has the same vector that it was inserted into this worm, but without the uh, naked mole rat GFP tag. And here you can see the tail of the animal, the head. You see this sort of a GFP expression, sort of a punctate formation. Um, here is uh, uh, taking away the animal. And then if you kind of blow it up to look at the uh, head region, you see that there's a lot of puncta around the, uh, the body wall, uh, muscle, um, around the pharynx area, and then the intestinal wall. This is uh, really uh, exciting. I, I do believe this is GFP. We have to do some further studies to sort of verify this. But, uh, but according to Wormbase, uh, the initial discoverer of GFP back in 2002, uh, Candida, the Candida group, uh, discovered that it kind of GFP or HSP25 using sort of antibody techniques is along these areas as well. So I'm pretty confident that you have the HSP25 GFP here. So when we look at uh, lar uh, larval stages, this is L4. It seems that there are more puncta in the larval stages. And then uh, the next step was then to determine if this sort of GFP uh, signal uh, or HSP25 expression uh, changes with age. So does it? So I looked at adults. Um, so, so day five and then day 13 adults, uh, it really doesn't change. Uh, it, there's about a 20% drop with age, but the change is not significant. Uh, there's a considerable overlap uh, near the means uh, that you can see. So this might be due to the uh, GFP sort of um, fading uh, over time, but we can also, again, verify this maybe with Western blots to both uh, GFP and HSP25 expression, see if we're actually perhaps losing uh, HSP25, um, which would be actually another interesting question, another avenue for, for, um, for research. All right. So uh, we wanted to examine this aggregation phenotype further. So generally, increased lifespan and heat resistance corresponds to a decreased aggregation phenotype. So many neurodegenerative uh, diseases have this aggregation phenotype. So Alzheimer's disease, uh, uh, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease have an aggregation type phenotype. Um, proteins containing these uh, containing polyglutamine repeats. So this is a Huntington's based model. About a 30 to 40 burden. Uh, kind of hurts cellular proteostasis. So uh, age-dependent protein aggregation can lead to cellular toxicity and death in these models. And the hypothesis was that HSP25 is a chaperone showing both lifespan extension and heat resistance would prevent this aggregation. But uh, that's not what happened. So this is the uh, control here. You see a few uh, puncture and aggregates with a control cross with Q44. Uh, y, it's a YFP. In the so it's an intestinal, intestinally driven uh, polyglutamine aggregate. But in the HSP25 cross, you see a lot more um, puncture and aggregates. This is at day five. Huh? How old are you? That's at day five of adult. So, um, so at this day five stage, we basically the number of aggregates per worm were higher, and there were more aggregate, there's a higher percentage of aggregates, of worms with aggregates. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to do that eventually. This is a ubiquitous expression. Uh, we wanted to kind of see if it had a whole body effect before going to uh, a muscle specific where HSP25 has its main action and then neuronal specific, which would be very interesting. So I guess uh, 
is a good segue. So HSP25 is part of this uh, family of HSP20 chaperones. Um, in vertebrates, you also know them as alpha-beta crystalline chaperones. So for example, HSBP5, which is alpha-beta crystalline, is very predominant in the brain. So I'm getting to that idea in a little bit that there, these, uh, while HSP25 is the, the protein, small hedgehog chaperone that I found, uh, they kind of work in concert. So, um, Yeah, they're both in the intestinal wall. Oh, so the Q44 or the, the base overexpression, right? Right, it's an, the Q44 has an intestinal driver. So the Q44, so that's actually kind of interesting. You don't really, with time, you see the, you see, you don't see puncta, even though it's crossed with the HSP25 overexpression worm. Uh, you don't see, while well, you see puncta, I, yeah, that's another additional experiment. I probably need to detract that. Because what I, we see is in the larval stages, before we subject them to the temperature sensitivity that drives the Q44, um, you still see the puncta or aggregates on the body wall. But then with time, so when you do conduct the experiment, then they sort of migrate to the intestinal wall. You don't, no longer see puncta on the, on the body wall. So, I mean, there's something dynamic going on, I believe. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they, uh, they, there is a delay in, there is a delay, right? So that's very, huh, what's that? Um, I don't know the exact delay in the larval stages. I know there's a delay to, to uh, adulthood as far as a reproductive, I don't know fecundity assay. So they, there's about, a, uh, I would say, a half a day delay to adulthood, so when they lay eggs, and they actually have, they lay less eggs. Although, the, even though the extension of time for egg laying is about another half a day. So they, they're, they're not as robust as a, a wild type. But that's similar to, like, the DAF2 mutants also very, you know, it has a fecundity and a larval developmental delay. Uh, I'll go Miranda and then Li Zhen. Right. No. Neither. So that's in the works. Um, that's definitely, you know, actually we're working on uh, uh, working up, working on working up that construct now into and putting it into the worms. So, um, however, uh, this act, this HSP25 is pretty well conserved, especially in the alpha beta crystalline domain. So. So while skin one, DAF16 are in the 30s and 40s, this is in like the high 50s, 56%. But then when you get to the alpha beta crystalline domain, it's about 85%. So the goal is, is you know, with this construct at the moment, continue working through the experiments while I catch up with the endogenous, probably, uh, construct, overexpression construct, and then see, if, and I, I expect that there'll be similar binding partners because of the, the conservation. Oh, Elijah, yeah. I'll get, I have some data. I mean, it might show that. I'll try to, yeah, I'll explain it. Um, it's in a couple slides. So, yeah, we did do, I did do a lifespan of the, of the Q44 control versus Q44 crossed with HSP25. It's in a couple slides. Ben? I'm sorry. When you make these lines, do you know where the insertion is? Um, no, it's a bombardment. And so, I guess my question is, how yeah. do you know That's why we back cross it several times to make sure we're not getting an insertion. For sure, but what if you insert it in, you know, in some pathway? That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, I have multiple lines. No, there are other ones that extended lifespan. So we're, we're going back and, and testing those replicate lines as well. Well, they, sorry, they have an extended lifespan. They have, were heat resistant. So, right, right, right. That's why I was wondering right. whether... You know, yeah, so we have to go back and do replicates. And then an another thing we can do is actually put it on a... Instead of using, for some, for some reasons, I'm going to change sort of the cassette and add sort of an M cherry or M Kate for instead of the GFP. And when we do, do that, we can see if it replicates the lifespan as well. 
to make sure it's an HSP25 effect versus a GFP or whatever a additional adjunct, I guess, effect. Yeah, Andrew? Uh, I know that John Kelly's group um, did a serious experiment where they had to express different um, HSPs in two flies. I was wondering if he or anyone else had looked at HSP 25, either in flies or... In flies, they looked at HSP 22, which is sort of the cardiac. Um, so it's HSBP8 in humans. It's a cardiac one, okay. and it, it seemed to I extend. They didn't... They looked at uh, stress resistance uh, more, you know, oxidative stress stressors, and it seemed to improve resistance to oxidative stress. Um, and then HSP25, uh, when they knock, they haven't done, I, for some reason there's no overexpression, but a knockout of HSP25 in the flies kind of messed up muscle morphology. So they had like a, I guess they couldn't, eventually they couldn't fly and walk. Right. But it, like I said, the, I mean, the, the endogenous is, and it was very highly expressed in the muscle and vertebrates when I looked at the rodent species. Um, and the endogenous uh, action of HSP25 seems to be in muscle, muscle fibers, either myosin or actin binding, or prevention of misfolding. All right. All right, so uh, there's a, the, the Hartle group uh, here. Um, they kind of put out a paper last year that might explain this sort of idea of why are there more aggregates and yet you still have extended lifespan. So you have these aggregate pro pro prone proteins, no nominally they're degraded by the uh, 20S proteasome before they get too large and toxic. Um, with age, however, you start to have these, these aggregate inclusions and you see this accumulation of small HSPs. Yeah, that was the other, actually the other thing in the Drosophila. So John found that these HSPs actually, his 22 increased with age or didn't really decline with age. So that kind of supports this kind of notion. Um, so then you have this, still have degradation, but then you have this accumulation of aggregate prone proteins. So then in, the, in a long-lived mutant like the DAFT2 mutant, which they looked at in this, in this paper, uh, they saw that, that you actually see a, a even more increase in aggregate prone proteins for some odd reason, and it increased the uh, proteasome activity, and also increased the number of aggregate inclusions and there was an enrichment of these small HSPs, such as HSP25 and another uh, small heat shock protein in this family, HSP43. So that kind of suggests a notion that these proteins are these surplus proteins are sequestered, and these aggregates might be protective. And like I said, DAFT mutants showed this increase in aggregates, and they're associated with the, the small heat shock protein that I'm studying, and another one, HSP43. So to go back to Li Zhen's uh, question, I did do a lifespan on these. HSP Q44 worms, and they still showed an extended lifespan. In the solids are the control versus the base HSP25, and the dotted lines are the control crossed with the Q44, and then the HSP25 crossed with the Q44. And while it is less than the, the, the sort of non-crossed animal, as you can see here, it's still higher and has a higher mean lifespan than the control crossed animal. So you can see this blown up. Um, here, and you can see the mean survival for the control was 13, uh, th median survival, excuse me, while the, for the HSP25 was 16. And then what I did then is I, I followed this lifespan again, and while I was doing the lifespan, I scored aggregates that are normally at our day five where we score them in this experiment, but also at day 13 where the median survival of the control was. And that, uh, this data, what this showed that was very interesting is that in the control animals, you really didn't see a change in the number of aggregates. Um, while in the cross animals, there was a decline in the number of aggregates from day five to day 13. You can see the box plot and the individual uh, animals. So uh, like we've already seen, however, that could be explained by a reduction in the signal, either the GFP or the YFP signal. But also the Dillon group and others suggest that maybe you have this, if you have this boost of proteostasis at a young age, then that can lead to a sufficient lifespan. And this is a, in a review, aging as an event of proteostasis collapse. And also, maybe even more exciting, there could be a clearance of these aggregates over time, either through uh, uh, autophagy or maybe disaggregation. So, uh, and I, I propose this because uh, the, sub, the Bacow group recently put out this publication where uh, they looked at HSP42 and HSP26 in Cerevisiae. And they showed that, uh, so basically HSP42 is a non, 
even though it's called a heat shock protein, it's not induced by stress. It's constitutively active. And when you have stress, either uh, heat stress, in this case, they use heat stress, but if you have oxidative stress or proteotoxic stress, HSP26 can be overexpressed. And these sort of sequester these partially unfolded uh, species and then prevent them from aggregating. And uh, in the case of the yeast, uh, in the case of yeast, they have a functioning uh, disaggregase called HSP100, and that kind of basically tears apart the aggregate. Um, unfortunately, metazoans, it's not very clear yet if they have a disaggregase. The, the putative data suggests that they do have a disaggregase, but it works very slowly. So they use alternative methods, methods to get rid of these large bodies. All right, so this is kind of what I explained. Uh, so again, this su sort of supports the idea of a con controlled cytoprotective aggregation where you create these aggregates before they, can become, before they can become toxic to the cell and then you know, using these chaperones and then either pull them apart or send, send them out of the cell or digest them through autophagy, potentially if they're not so big, um, before they become aggregated, uh, maybe the proteasome machinery as well. All right. And these features can control, contribute to this facilitated chaperone-mediated disaggregation. So fortunately, uh, like I mentioned earlier about C. elegans, there's this wide body of genetic tools available. So the CGC actually had an HSP43 knockout. So I did a lifespan at 25 degrees and 20 degrees. And it does have a slight, uh, a slight reduction in lifespan, which is pretty interesting, both at 25 and at 20 degrees. What's uh, more interesting is that um, there is no significant difference in the median lifespan at between 25, 25 and 20 degrees in the uh, HSP43, which kind of supports the, the idea that the Baku group had that 43 is not induced or affected by temperature. So the next step is to then cross these animals with HSP25 um, and see if the knockout of the HSP43 perturbs this uh, HSP25 Q40, and then, well, for one, reduces the lifespan potential, the HSP, HSP25 transgenic, and then we can also cross it with the 25 Q44 and see if it affects the aggregation accumulation, and, we, and look at other phenotypes and how HSP43 influences these. So this is kind of a, the first step in a model. It'll expand, I promise. So you have HSP25 overexpression, and uh, something happens here where you increase the number of small heat shock proteins, potentially along, you know, not just uh, 43, but HSP16, which has also been studied in aging, and that might increase lifespan. So, I mentioned that the putative transcription factor for HSP25 is HSF1, heat shock factor 1. And uh, so I did a lifespan of HSF1 to start looking at apostasis. And I did a lifespan here using HSF1 RNAi. And uh, so here is the solid, again, is the control, a black control, and then the HSP25 overexpression. And you see uh, it still has that increase. It's very consistent. And then when I use the uh, HSF1 RNAi, it reduces the lifespan of both the control and similarly of the overexpression. So there is a dependency on HSF1 uh, transcription factor on this, uh, there's a dependency on this, of this lifespan on the HSF1, uh, yes, dependency on this, on this lifespan of HSF1. So, so the questions that could be asked here or what could be happening is that uh, HSF1 is sort of activating the HSF1 pathway, or alternatively, since it's overexpressed, um, it could be a, stress, uh, a stressor in and of itself by sequestering all the other HSPs from the necessary function of the, of the worm, and then that causes an, uh, additional uh, pathways that are opened up to improve uh, lifespan through stress. So uh, the next step here in this line of experiments is to uh, characterize a downstream signal of, of these HSPs. We can use RNA-seq to see if HSP70, uh, HSP16, et cetera, are increased, and then you use a directed nanostring to test a panel of HSPs to see if they go up or down uh, as well. So, and we would do this RNA-seq on, on the control, the uh, overexpressor, and then with the RNAi treatment of HSF1. So, all right. So that kind of expands our model. So this increase of HSP25 overexpression uh, potentially leads to an activation of HSF1 as there's a dependency on this final phenotype. This could lead to an expression of other HSPs, but not just the small heat shock proteins, 
maybe the HSP70 uh, machinery. And this can in turn increase lifespan. So this is either an activation or depletion phenomenon. So we still need to test that, like I mentioned with the RNA-seq experiments. Um, interestingly, recently, so HSF1 induction also induces autophagy. This is both has been seen in immortal cell lines uh, with the Tanaka group, and also in uh, Melena Hansen's group has been shown recently in worms. So potentially, what could be happening, and that might be suggestive of the, the depletion of aggregates that I see with age, is that autophagy might be performing some action triggered by the overexpression of HSP25, which, which uh, activates HSF1, which in turn activates autophagy. And then autophagy has a lot of crosstalk with other HSPs. For example, HSP, HSC70 is important in chaperone-mediated autophagy. Interestingly, if you induce, if you add a proteotoxic stress that induces one of these small heat shock chaperones like uh, HSP25, you also see a corresponding increase on autophagy. So this is question, a question because you don't know if this is sort of formation of the aggregates that's driving or the clearance by autophagy that's sort of driving this phenomenon that could then in turn lead to an increased lifespan. Or you could, you know, substitute lifespan for, uh, you know, reduction of neurodegenerative plaques, disease, et cetera. So I followed up, I followed up this epistasis with uh, two other important transcription factors. So the DAF, so DAF16 is in the uh, DAF2 pathway. It's also known as FOXO invertebrates. And then the skin one, uh, skin one, which is NRF1, NRF2 invertebrates. So I've performed lifespans on these using RNAi. And uh, what we see here is that so this is a control again. We see this increase in lifespan, control RNAi on the, you know, um, you have to see a 20% increase in lifespan compared to the control. And DAF16 when we use RNAi. Uh, we really don't see a reduction in lifespan, which uh, was surprising. There is evidence in flies um, that FOXO is a transcription factor for some of these small heat shock proteins, but this may not be the case, at least for HSP25, maybe for other small heat shock proteins. And then, uh, but in skin one, even though we see a, uh, incre uh, no change in the maximum lifespan, there is sort of this dip and only a, a, a very slight increase in the median lifespan. So the skin doesn't need to be repeated. Um, just to kind of verify this phenomenon, um, but maybe this, pheno this HSP transgenic lifespan extension might be slightly dependent on skin one as well, which opens up a, a lot of possibilities when we get to our model. So skin one here could trigger other stress pathways. As you know, skin one, NRF2, triggers the oxidative stress pathway as well. So it could, uh, could be, this whole thing could be a stress response that triggers HSF1 and skin one in tandem to increase lifespan uh, and other health uh, outcomes. Interestingly, there is crosstalk between skin one and HSF1, which is not, su not surprising. Uh, there could be crosstalk, which is, uh, shows the evidence of cytoprotection. So uh, skin one was actually found as a bind, uh, when they did a screen to look at, when the Morimoto group did a screen to look for binding partners for HSP70. So it has some uh, coactivity or co-binding with HSP70, which uh, might suggest that not just autophagy is involved, but, uh, but in metazoans, the disaggregase machinery is driven by 70, HSP70, HSP40, and HSP110, and although not as robust as in yeast, uh, maybe skin one could be opening up disaggregation as a backup to autophagy, which is probably what metazoans use as their primary clearance mechanism for these uh, toxic oligomers and aggregates. All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm developing new tools. Some of them have been suggested or mentioned already uh, to kind of pursue the, the, that, that, uh, that mechanism, to kind of answer these different questions on this mechanistic chart. And uh, these tools are to take the endogenous HSP25 and put it onto a, uh, a different type of reporter system, maybe add a 6 his tag or a, some other tag to it so I can do some proteomics and look at uh, the interactome of HSP25. Right now it's on a SIR5 promoter, but uh, we want to put it on a muscle driver or a neuronal specific promoter. Um, alternatively, with our current uh, worm line that we have, we can take another polyglutamine repeat and uh, put m cherry on that, so then we can distinguish. So right now the Q44 that I use is on a YFP. It's very hard to distinguish GFP versus YFP. So if we put this Q40, uh, this polyglutamine repeat on it with an M cherry, 
we can then distinguish the puncta a lot, uh, a lot better and see if maybe there's some um, interaction between the HSP25 GFP or co-localization between the polyglutamine and the, uh, and the HSP25 overexpression. And we put that also on a, a general promoter. It's actually intestinal, I believe. Um, all right. And then um, in, I have a, I've started a collaboration with Tali uh, Gildovitz at uh, Drexel University. And this is an, uh, if we wanted to kind of ex examine the question of what happens if you doubly overexpress these small heat shock proteins. And she discovered this HSP12 in a screen of dour worms. So worms in their uh, early larval stages can go into a dour form where they can kind of live for a very, very long time. Um, so HSP12 was very highly expressed in dour. And, my, and in yeast, interestingly, it's involved in uh, cold stress, triolose um, associate, or organization, and maybe might be important in the, why they survive when you use like a, do a glycerol stock and freeze them down. So maybe that's the same thing that happens with worms that it's important in that type of uh, starvation and cold stress survival. So this is on a myo promoter. So we're going to design this myo HSP25, this myo uh, HSP12, and uh, see what they do individually, and then. Uh, cross them and see what we get. So, all right. And then uh, there's other experiments we're going to do that'll be done with some of the tools that I've developed or that have been suggested out here. Um, we're definitely going to run RNA seq as uh, soon as we can, and then we're going to look at some other metastable temperature sensitive mutants so that the phenomenon that we're getting is not isolated to that particular polyglutamine. I guess that seems to be. A, that's like the first go-to uh, that I've noticed in worm research is using these polyglutamine models. And hopefully this is not a phenomenon specific to polyglutamines. I'd like to expand to other temperature sensitive mutants and then use other sort of uh, models of neurodegenerative disease such as alpha beta and then other non-aggregating disease such as tau to see if, uh, see if we see a similar phenomenon. Uh, like was mentioned, I'm going to do muscle and neuron specific uh, overexpression. And then we can also assay with some of these temperature-sensitive mutants for muscle and neuronal uh, function and see if we get a rescue with our HSP25 overexpression, see if it's involved in, in a physiological effect. Then biochemically, um, we want to kind of examine these puncta and see what's going on with them. Are they indeed aggregates? So we can do these insolubility-solubility assays in an unbiased manner. This is a technique developed by Gordon Lithgow, who's at the buck. And then, you know, all right, and then, uh, we can also then look at the HSP uh, interactome. As I showed, I want to put like a his tag or some sort of uh, tag so you can pull down HSP25 overexpressed uh, proteins. And uh, there's a technique adapted by uh, Andrew Truman, who's now at uh, in North Carolina. And uh, so basically the idea would be to take adults or treatments or different days, extract the lysate, purify the complex with the tag on it, and then do uh, uh, basically LCMS mass spectrometry to examine what proteins are bound and what client protein, what proteins could be bound to these aggregates and what the client proteins of the chaperone might be. And this is kind of an idea of what uh, you might see. Uh, you see an increased interaction or maybe even a decreased interaction depending on the, the treat, birth treatment versus untreated or on age. And then you might see nothing or an increased interaction. So it can be pretty interesting uh, revealing data that can suggest other pathways and other uh, molecular targets, because that would be the idea. For me is, um, in a lot of this sort of proteostasis research, we know the driver, but we, we don't really understand what the targets are, and the targets might be just as important as, what's, you know, as what, is what we see overexpressed or increased in expression. And then eventually what I'd want to do is to sort of the mechanism that I discover in the worm, kind of take that back and import these, this, these directed types of proteins into a vertebrate cell system or even into, uh, into a, a, a whole animal, so, such as a mouse. And we still have the naked mole rat, so perhaps we can see if there's any of these are uh, increased in the naked mole rat as well. All right. So, so thank the people that have helped me along the way, um, my funding source, and a lot of the collaborators that I have uh, currently developing um, projects with. So thanks for your time. If you have any other questions, I'll be happy to take them.